Hello and welcome to Around the Verse, our weekly look at the development of Star Citizen. I'm Chris Roberts. And I'm Eric Cameron Davis. Chris, it's great to have you back on Around the Verse. How was your trip to the UK and Frankfurt offices? Uh, very productive. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned in last week's newsletter, uh, we held an overall project review in Frankfurt. I was joined there by CIG team members from across the globe, all from all our four studios actually. Uh, we reviewed and planned sprints, uh, as well as worked to improve the overall cockpit experience. Uh, when you're flying around in Star Citizen, so you'll see that down the road. Not quite yet, but it'll be cool. That sounds great. And one of the best parts of Star Citizen is flying around the universe. Which brings us to today's episode. We'll be sharing some of the technical considerations that have gone into the upcoming planetary outposts that will populate future PU environments. Yes, but first, let's check in with the Austin and Turbulent Studios for their updates. Hey guys, Jake Ross here, producer here in Austin. I wanted to take a quick second to thank Clifford, aka Miku, Simperium, and Doc Tari for their generous and delicious gifts to the Austin studio. We always appreciate the show of love and support from our community, and these tasty treats help keep us fueled and encouraged. So thanks, guys. Now let's take a look at what our full-bellied team here in Austin uh, has been up to this past month. This last month, the Austin design team has been focused on getting 262 out the door, among other things. 262 work has consisted uh, mainly of adding new subscriber flare items and fixing some minor bugs as well. We're also updating additional shop-related elements as we continue to build upon the shopping system. While I can't go into major detail right now, I can say revisions of the Stanton system map are in progress. Also, Landing Zone AI and Usables are undergoing additional development. For this month, we have a peek at our latest subscriber flare and details on how we're expanding the shopping tech to utilize some new tools that relate to the Item 2.0 system. First, let's take a look at the new subscriber flare that will be rolled out in the coming months. One of the new items is called the Vivid Display, which can display game locations holographically. Players can use the Vivid Display to find out more about locations, including their intended visuals. Other flare items include a series of ship schematics, which will showcase the level of detail that goes into our ship design. These lightboard displays can be hung from any poster-style port in your hangar. We hope you'll enjoy these upcoming additions to subscriber flare and look forward to additional flare in the near coming months. Now we'd like to share how we're revamping the shopping system for our next release. As the Item 2.0 system advances, the item port structure changes so it can fall in line with our end goal. These fluctuations have forced us to readdress the setup for things like ship, uh, shop mannequins and item bundles. While the end result will be pretty obvious to the players, the differences for the designers will change drastically uh, for the better. Our goal is to create a base mannequin object that the shopping system can apply loadouts to. The items on a given mannequin would be purchasable by themselves or as a bundle for a discounted price. In the past, every outfit was only purchable, purchasable as an entire set of items. On top of that, a bespoke mannequin setup had to be generated for each unique outfit display. Fortunately, our advancing tech will soon allow our loadout editor to quickly create various item combinations within a given shop. That loadout, comprised of items in the shop, will then be assigned to the shop's inventory as a bundle. The shopping system will then spawn these bundles directly onto an empty shop mannequin with no additional effort by the designers. A process that took hours before will soon only take minutes, allowing us to quickly generate different item combinations that can be displayed on the mannequins. What seems like a minor change actually unlocks a multitude of options for the design team to create realistic shops. Hopefully you'll be able to see the fruits of this labor really soon uh, in our upcoming releases. The PU animation team just finished a small mocap shoot using our in-house OptiTrack system. This was a pickup shoot to help us fill in all the gaps from the performance capture shoots done previously at Imaginarium Studios. We captured transition animations for both male and female characters. Examples of a transition animation include some sitting down at tables with trays, going through a chow line to get food, eating, drinking, rummaging, or sitting in cockpits and turrets. The transition animations are shot in such a way that they can work with our metrics and are universal enough to be used all over the game with many different usables in our environments. If you're not familiar with the term usable, as a reminder, it's a, a usable is an object that a player or NPC can interact with, like a chair, wall, table, or other set piece. Usables also include props, like cups and plates and bottles, and anything else that can physically be picked up by a person. We are currently implementing these transition animations into our usable system. Obviously, animation can only get these game assets so far. Our biggest challenge right now is making all the usable function in-game properly. It is up to code, tech, and designers to make them work together, which is why Austin Animation is working closely with our Frankfurt and UK studios on this. Metrics are being created for door control panels, bathrooms, toilet facilities, and chow lines in the Idris Mess Hall. We're putting tech in place that will allow an NPC to navigate a usable set piece and perform a variety of actions, like grabbing a usable prop, setting other usable props onto it, and walking away with the prop, going to and interacting with another usable set piece. Um, 
then getting up and navigating to a third usable set piece to dispose of the usable prop with all the usable props on it. Once we get this one test case fully functional, we'll be able to apply what we have developed throughout the game. The ship animation team has finished the major animation task for the Drake Cutlass Black. Characters can now enter and exit the pilot and co-pilot seats properly. For the co-pilot, we're utilizing a brand new cockpit template that we're calling the Stick Template. This template positions the player in a pose like that of a helicopter pilot. This was required to fit the new geometry of the Cutlass cockpit. We're also planning to support the cockpit experience improvement pass, but we'll have more info on that next time. On the DevOps side, we added additional logging to better track issues that are wonderful community experiences from time to time. The logging we added allows, to, uh, allows us to dump the status of the user's download session at the moment they experience the issue. We then work directly with the community relations team here in Austin to debug the issue uh, or issues the user is ex experiencing. A great example of this is the latest version of the patcher, patcher 249. As some of the Windows 10 users may have already noticed, this version of the patcher brought back music that had previously been missing. The exact cause of the issue was that Windows 10 sound settings were set to 192 kilohertz. This was causing the patcher to crash if you had the music turned on. You can now enjoy all of Pedro Camacho's music once again. The QA department here in Austin has been heavily focused on 262 testing. With the addition of multiplayer mega map and serialized variables, we were required to perform multiple cross studio playtests between Austin and UK. We did this to check for any new and unexpected behaviors due to the major system changes, such as increased desynchronization, lag between clients, massive performance changes, good or bad, and crashes, lots and lots of crashes. The new Drake Buccaneer came online sooner than expected, so the ship team performed frequent testing to ensure the ship was operating as expected when it makes its way into backers' hands. In our development stream testing, Squadron 42 testing continues, as well as a range of tests with the ground vehicles on planetary surfaces in a multiplayer environment. We've also been testing various developmental tools such as the Procedural Planet Editor, or PlanEd, and the Subsumption Editor. Finally, we expanded the QA team in Austin by another four testers, bringing the Austin QA team to a total of 24 members. We're excited about this expansion and excited to have new people on board. Thanks for watching, guys, and for all your support. We'll see you in the verse. Oh, hello. Fancy seeing you here. This is Benoit from Turbinet, and this is our Turbinet update for this month. Last week, we were hosted by our friend Jared Huckabee and the community team for a subscriber town hall. Now, this was our first ever town hall. We were super excited to get it set up and a bit nervous to participate, but you guys sent us awesome questions, and we're hoping that we're going to be able to do some more town hall questions so that we can address the questions and uh, different um, things you want to know about Spectrum and uh, the platform we're building. This month we launched Spectrum version 0.3.2, which includes major performance updates to how we render messages and threads in the client. So hopefully this will allow you guys to switch faster between lobbies and channels and should take way less CPU and render time than it used to do in the 0.3.1 version. So I'm sure hoping that you guys can see the difference already. Uh, 0.3.2 also brings two new features. Uh, you can now reorder your communities at the top left of the sidebar. All you have to do is you grab your community and, gra and drag it, drop it to the location you want to keep it, and we'll persist that across all your browser tabs and sessions. And so you can keep your favorite org at the top if that's what you want to do. Second feature is uh, we worked on the channel thread list. Now when you see the subjects, we added thumbnail images to threads that contain media information and videos. And so this way, we c it's way more entertaining to view the channel list because you'll see uh, the previews, media previews there. So then you'll, you'll have uh, more incentive to click on those subjects and view the media content embedded in it. Uh, otherwise, we've also worked on mobile optimization and keyboard fixes. Unfortunately, we're not quite done yet and we're not happy with the fixes, so we had to roll them back from 032. We're hoping that it's going to be ready for 0.3.3. This should fix bugs on mobile Android uh, that people have been uh, encountering when basically typing into uh, the chat on mobile Android. So we're hoping to fix that soon. The future holds good stuff for 0.3.3, which should come with a new feature, again, for forums uh, called nested threads. And so uh, nested threads will allow you to create a new thread and change the discussion type from a classic chronological timeline thread into a nested discussion. Now, this gives us two benefits. Uh, first, uh, we can now sort by uh, upvotes, the replies, at the first level and get a nested reply tree behind it. Uh, but the second thing is that we give you guys more control into the type of discussion that you want to start. So the OP creator will have the option of choosing whether it's a nested thread uh, or not. 
And so as we add all these features into the next releases of Spectrum, we're getting ready to be able to shut down and archive the old forms. One of the first, we cannot do that until we've expanded our categories list to bring all those discussions from the old forms in. We're not talking about an import, but at this point we're talking about recreating the subcategories that you guys enjoyed on the old forum inside uh, the, the new system. So we're talking about shipyards, ship owner threads and stuff like this. Uh, so as soon as we're able to do that, we'll be able to announce a date at which the old forums will go into archive mode. Uh, but we'll give you guys plenty of notice before we do that. This month we also worked on the uh, new Delta Patcher, as you guys have called it. And so we are responsible for building the actual application that hosts the patching libraries. And so we've done a bunch of progress this month in getting this new application set up. It's using a whole new application stack. Uh, you guys might be familiar with it. It's called Electron. Uh, Electron Shell, we're also using React and Redux like we do for Spectrum within this new application. And so we've worked on our native bindings to get the patching libraries that the Frankfurt guys are working on. And so we're currently able to patch the game data uh, with this new uh, launcher. It's also used internally. So we're really excited about this project. This is going to bring a lot more dynamism in how we release patches. And so we're really excited to get this moving and integrate it into this new app. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to release that to you guys in the next coming months. Another major project we started this month is a, a redesign of some of the elements of the RSI site. We're trying to, this is a massive overhaul of the website and uh, how it caters to new users and older users. And so as we start this design process, we'll be starting to give you guys some updates on what we're doing on that front and how that shapes up. But we're only getting started right now. One important project that we're also working on that has done a lot of, uh, has been seen a lot of progress this month is the ship stats updates. And so we know that the ship stats uh, don't currently reflect what's exactly in game. Now I want to mention again that the ship stats are supposed to reflect the intent design of a ship and not necessarily the exact stats that are currently in game. Uh, but at the same time, currently there are things that are missing, and so we're working on to put that up to date. We got all the information to do so, and so now we're working on changing how the backend uh, ma manages this and redesigning some of the tech view and tech specifications view and hollow viewer changes to be able to display that. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to go through all of the current loadouts um, in the next coming weeks to be able to show you guys an update there. That's it for Turbulent. Thank you guys for watching. Thanks guys, the ship animation team did a fantastic job on the redesigned Cutlass Black. And with the Buccaneer flight ready, we're proud to announce that the entire Drake lineup is all in engine, which is a pretty big achievement. Yeah, and they're also all on sale. Now you can get the Buccaneer, Dragonfly, Herald, Caterpillar, and Cutlass until April 10th. Yeah, so the sale includes all three models of the Cutlass, including the updated Cutlass Black. People often question the business ethics of Drake Interplanetary, so we decided to dig in a little deeper into what Drake's been up to. Take a look. Seventy years ago, Drake Interplanetary built the Cutlass in a gamble to win a military bid. But the military didn't bite. Drake Interplanetary wasn't deterred, however. The company retrofitted the Cutlass for civilian use. When we first rolled out a flyable model of the Cutlass to the public, it kind of drifted from our own expectations and from our own intent. Um, it lost some of the aggressive characteristics that we had, had sold it on when we first unveiled it. And that was one of the biggest things we wanted to recapture in the rework. We wanted to make it feel like, look and feel like the, the ship we had originally promised to people. Um, but. To really pull that off, we did have to make some changes and split off a few pieces of functionality. But then what that left us with was a lot more room to really build on the uh, rating support potential of the Drake Cutlass, where now this can be that backbone of a small militia unit, of a small just defense group. The first iteration of the Cutlass uh, wasn't very ergonomical for the pilot or the co-pilot. Um, we, had, we had many complaints from uh, the customers saying uh, it's hard to get in and out and you know, people stepping on other people's toes. So uh, we went with a, with a better design on this one. Uh, we have the pilot and co-pilot being able to enter and exit from either side of their seat stations with 
neither the pilot nor co-pilot getting in the way of each other on enter or exit uh, for much uh, faster mounting, dismounting. Uh, the living quarters have also been uh, retrofitted to be uh, a little bit more spacious. Uh, the armaments uh, have been upgraded. We have uh, more space for uh, uh, armored equipment, uh, as well as bunk racks, the main living quarters, as well as access to the, uh, the gun's main weapon system uh, located in the living quarters instead of uh, the rear. It's, it's going to be a very potent threat to come across for you know, mid-sized ships and up because it's going to carry a lot of missile firepower. Uh, we've added more guns to the ship. Uh, just its general armor and durability can now really sell through both in its appearance and its performance. We didn't skimp out on what it can do. Uh, we made sure you can, you can haul your cargo, you can haul your friends, uh, you can blow up a ship if it's trying to take you down. Some people uh, decide to use our ship to take other people down, I guess. The Travel Safety Advisory System estimates that 15,000 people die annually in outlaw raids, and the Cutlass Black accounts for two-thirds of all ships used by known piracy groups. People have often questioned Drake Interplanetary's role in these raids. Is the company intentionally marketing their inexpensive but deadly Cutlass Black to criminals? We decided to find out. Posing as an applicant for their sales department, one of our reporters traveled to the Magnus system and sat down with Drake Interplanetary's long-standing CEO, Jan Dredge. She didn't know she was being recorded. Your resume is quite impressive. As you probably assumed, this last interview is really more of a formality. Can I ask a question? Ask away. Unless they're salary related, that goes through HR. Oh, of course, of course. I, I am curious about the Cutlass Black. Have you considered including mandatory background checks for buyers, you know, to avoid selling to criminals? Listen, what happens after a Cutlass leaves the showroom isn't my problem. When there's a murder, do you blame the killer or the person who manufactured the gun? After this audio was released, family members of piracy victims expressed their outrage by calling for a ban on the Drake Cutlass. Today, Drake Interplanetary responded with a press statement. We apologize for the comments made by Jan Dredge. After many years of devoted service, Miss Dredge has decided to retire as CEO of Drake Interplanetary and spend more time with her family. While she will continue to remain on the board, Miss Dredge will no longer be involved in daily business operations. Her son, John Dredge, will fulfill her duties as acting CEO until a replacement can be found. Drake Interplanetary is committed to the safety of all citizens and civilians. Our Cutlass Blue and Cutlass Red models are specifically designed for use by police and first responders. They continue to save countless lives across the universe. The Terra Gazette has confirmed that Jan Dredge's so-called retirement goes into effect today. However, Drake Interplanetary refuses to comment on whether they will continue to sell the Cutlass Black to known piracy groups. It's really great when ships can be as varied as our characters. Yeah, absolutely. And people maybe know the Cutlass as an outlaw ship, but uh, that's just one way it can be used. Yeah, totally, absolutely, just one way. I mean, <laughs> you know, the Cutlass can do many other things from search and rescue to militia, cargo transport. It's really up to how the owner chooses to fly it. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. No, all. not at all. Of course, the only thing better than a great ship is really having great places to fly it to. Yeah, that's right. And as Star Citizen grows and the procedural planets to continue to develop, we've started looking at ways to populate the amazing vistas with various points of interest you can travel to. Uh, so one of the cases is um, the planetary outpost that we've been giving you some sneak peeks at. And we're going to dive a little deeper into that now, so take a look. Hello, my name's Ian Leyland. I'm the Environment Art Director at Foundry 42. Uh, today, it'd be really interesting to talk a little bit about surface outposts. So, I think people have seen a few of these before. We've shown some little videos here and there, and uh, when the communities come around the studio, they've had a little sneak peek. But this is the first real opportunity to really show what it's about, and more importantly, the team involved in making it. So, my name's Eddie Hilditch. I am the Senior Environment Art Lead. My name is uh, Alex Fermatti. 
and I'm a senior technical artist working on the uh, procedural aspect of uh, our system. Hi, my name is Nick Etheridge, and I'm a lead artist on um, for the PU team for environments. So the initial idea came from design. Design needed a place to bring the player to the smallest possible location. So we have cities, space stations, but one thing we never really had is these smallest locations. So that was the initial idea from design of what a surface outpost would be. So we went away and we started looking at concepts for what they might look like in our universe. So we knew we wanted to integrate them quite well with the environment. So we wanted a design that felt durable, robust, and felt like it could survive a few harsh winters. So from there, we started some mood charts just to see and explore what might work right. And then once we had some nice ideas, we got it validated, make sure it worked for Chris and the design director, and then we started taking it into production. So from there, you know, one of the things we knew we wanted to do, like these were going to be modular. We didn't want just one hero location. So the visual style and elements needed to support a modular format. So during the ideation process and concepting, we needed to make sure we had elements that we could, you know, break up the visual language, break up that fatigue and enable design to create some interesting layouts, which still felt quite interesting to look at. So we build all our environments modularly. Um, we have to build them in that way to incorporate the sort of vast number of environments we need across our universe. Um, so once the concept has been signed off from Ian, we will start breaking that concept down into its constituent parts um, in order to figure out how many pieces we need to begin the process of making the brand new building set, which is going to be our high tech surface outposts. We took the uh, concept and we we made the outpost uh, concept using the template set, which is a a set we use to white box all of our our levels because it's a basic set. It's to metrics. It's got a simple material on it, and it's good for artists and designers and engineers just to block out areas and and test with. So we took that, we modified it slightly and started creating the uh, outpost layout that we had from concept. Uh, then we added the, uh, we white boxed add-on pieces like the roof pieces, antennas, pipes, to get that extra silhouette read from a distance, uh, mid and far distances. The biggest challenge was probably uh, making sure that it's all modular and fits together because the whole point of it being modular is it gives the artist the flexibility of, of, of many different layouts of, of of swapping pieces round and adding a bit of variation and detail. So from its foundation, it had to be uh, very modular, uh, work together to metrics uh, have, have, and have approval from design too. So the key things at the uh, gray box stage are making sure that the assets are in line with the art style, that the material breakup's correct, the forms are correct, and it's still modular from, from what we were doing with white box that design have play tested it and it works for their gameplay requirements and that any major performance issues are looked at as well. Often the gray box is modeled to a higher level of detail than the final, the actual final asset. And this is because the, all the ideas and forms and details get shaped out of this phase. And these will sometimes get baked later on down to a texture. So often the gray box is actually uh, a lot more expensive than the final form. So when the assets go into final production, at this point we'll, we'll f flesh out the material library. So the material library will consist of simple, tileable uh, materials uh, with wear and dirt, such as simple metals, plastics, to more complex panels, to uh, very detailed greeble sheets, trim sheets, and graphical decals. Uh, and illumination sheets for lighting. We need to make, make sure the materials work together, that they're all conforming to the correct PBR workflow. And at that point, then we go into the final production and apply those materials and flesh out the final assets. Once we started to test our outposts on the actual surfaces of the planet, we soon realized that a perfectly flat base was just not gonna work. It was gonna limit where we were able to place them. Planets don't tend to be perfectly even, you know. Um, 
everywhere we place them, we'd end up with a corner clipping through the ground or a corner floating above the ground. So we had to go back to the drawing board and kind of incorporate a system of legs and feet, um, which ultimately allowed us to place them in much more varied places on the surface of a planet. Um, then we obviously had to get the player from the surface of the planet up to the door of the outpost. Um, we thought a ramp would kind of look really cool um, visually, so we started implementing those. But after talking with design, we realized our ramp metrics from them was 15 degrees, which is actually very shallow for a ramp. And we ended up with um, outposts that kind of looked like a Miami Beach house or something, because even if the outpost was only three meters off the ground, we had to have an 11 meter long ramp to sort of cope with it. Um, and they kind of look ridiculous. So we went back to the drawing board. We thought, uh, switch back ramps maybe, or some kind of complicated elevator system with ladders. But ultimately, simplest um, solutions are often the best. Um, and we ended up with stairs, very high tech, but stairs actually turned out to just serve the purpose that we needed them to. Once all the final assets were made, uh, we basically group them together into prefabs, which are like smart groups, and um, brought them in. So there's walls, there's rooms, there's doorways and airlocks and, and uh, the stair piece. So uh, it's very easy now to make uh, a whole different layouts of the outpost instead of having to bring each individual asset and each light and each vis area. They're all prefabbed up, so you drop a room in, then you drop some walls in, and it's it's done. Uh, and it and it allows for more um, more time working on the actual assets than than world building. Um, we have the ability to recreate the concept pretty much one to one, which is great. But what we also have on top of that, thanks to the modularity of it, is the ability to create a vast number of variety of layouts, um, and we can basically make as many kinds of layouts within the same sort of theme and style as we want. And as we develop the building set more and it matures and we add extra pieces, that variety and the number of potential layouts we can create basically exponentially increases. What comes down the line later is how to add more variety. Like we can't have just white outposts every time you see an outpost, it's not gonna be the same outpost. It's gonna change layouts, it's gonna change uh, materials is going to change what add-ons get added to it. That all comes later. What we have here is a proof of concept and a final asset in its simplest form, but with the ability to expand massively on it as we sort of move along with its development. Yeah. So after the environment team has been in production for a certain period of time, that's when I'll start looking back into it with it again. We can visually see how the ideas progressed and we're getting some good ideas, but this is where I start introducing visual targets for the guys to work to. And from the process of going from the initial idea to it going through into production, you know, obviously the team has made additional design choices and visual choices to improve the design, but then this is a good time to just take another look at it and seeing how it's working. So initially when I was looking at it this time, I saw the real importance of how we're gonna integrate these things. So it's not only good to have beautiful architecture, you need that believability of understanding, actually this thing has been here for many years and how does that feel? So what I did, I did some visual targets for the team, looking at things like materials, lighting, particles, just to kind of describe that M frame. So working with what they'd already produced and the visual targets, that was perfect for the team to kind of take it onto the final art stage of production. When, when I received uh, these uh, visual targets, the first thing I tried to understand is how those uh, uh, elements have been built, how are the modules being uh, divided, uh, and then uh, try to build uh, uh, a less granular version of uh, of those model pieces, uh, for example, a room uh, or a, a wall to cap a side of a room uh, is uh, uh, what we call prefabs. So they are kind of Lego pieces. Uh, when, uh, when we have defined uh, these kind of rules uh, within uh, our uh, small R&D team, 
we start building uh, connection points uh, and tag points to help us stitch together those pieces. We define uh, design rules uh, and uh, uh, layout paths to make sure that the generation of this layout is uh, controlled, uh, is based uh, on a clear aspect, uh, visual aspect, and on a clear design, uh, on a clear cap of size. Uh, and uh, when, when we have all these rules, we start trying out and iterate on the process of uh, giving a feedback to artists uh, for having uh, a different variations uh, or uh, having a new rule set to, to stitch the things together in a different way. Once the goal uh, is reached, what we want to do with these uh, uh, elements, with these outposts, is to uh, uh, create as more variations uh, as we can and then create a lot of uh, uh, perceived variation for the player so that when we uh, scatter them on, on a planet, the player can play and can uh, <coughs> see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of different location, a lot of different sizes, a lot of different uh, uh, vistas. At that moment comes a, a second uh, uh, aspect of the procedural uh, uh, variation, which is placing them on a planet. Also in this case, uh, what we have uh, is uh, our principal artist uh, and our art direction working on uh, uh, giving a, a visual target of how they want the uh, outpost to look when they are placed on uh, planetary surfaces. So we have uh, a lot of things like lightning, the planetary materials, uh, the weather system, uh, the, the aging of the outpost uh, coming in as variables to set some defaults on the outpost. We have the surface itself that could be very even or uneven, and we need to make sure that the outpost is uh, correctly placed uh, this has been one of the biggest challenge we're still tackling, which is uh, how we can find the uh, correct place uh, on the planetary surface to guest our outpost. So sometimes we have uh, a fit system adapting, uh, which is one of the first solution, but we also have uh, a better shading system to integrate the fit on it, or we have uh, a terrain system uh, trying to adapt and trying to give more uh, a more clear and more uh, uh, even uh, place for the player also to be able to enter into the outpost. Uh, we, we face problems uh, with, uh, with the, the access to the out these outposts, uh, and we have tried to find uh, visual and technical solutions for these. Uh, the, the Planet Editor is one of the tools we're using for placing them, is trying to find uh, correct uh, 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 average distance of this kind of uh, outpost, uh, finding a correct spot on the planet, uh, and then giving to the uh, designers a way to uh, modify these settlements, because together with the outpost, we will get some visual add-ons, which are just uh, very nice elements that will give variation to these uh, groups with to these outposts and also some design elements. Uh, for example, a loot crate could be a design element that needs to go together with the outpost to give the gameplay. Uh, these elements uh, get also uh, variated by the Planet Editor by accessing some uh, defaults uh, or some uh, uh, design changes through time and through missions, which is uh, uh, what uh, uh, we were mentioning before, uh, like changing uh, in runtime the values of uh, the wear and dirt system that could give, uh, uh, if the planet is sandy, could give uh, uh, a varying amount of sand on the surface of, uh, of the outpost. We're looking into uh, more aspects uh, for interior and exteriors to be different. So the interior could have rust and dust and the exteriors could have uh, the planet affecting it with uh, mud or, or, or uh, the sand, as we said. Uh, we're looking into other variations as well, uh, uh, interior dressing with props. Uh, there will be probably a sneak peek on it. It's actually all the things you see from my side, they're still in R&D. They're clearly 
in a, a white box phase because the visual target we're trying to reach is very, very high. I'm confident that what we have reached is very good, but it's actually considered gray box on this title, which is incredible. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed the piece. It gives you a good idea of where we're up to right now with the surface outposts and given a little introduction to some of the team members that's going into making them. You know, sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution, like the stairs on the outpost. Yep, but like we saw, it takes a little trial and error to find the, uh, the easy solution. Although a, a little. A little, little trial. Yeah, yeah, a little trial. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it for this week's ATV. But before we go, I want to thank all of our backers. You are the reason Star Citizens Development is possible. Yes, and a big thank you to all our subscribers. Your contributions help us produce all this great content. And to show our gratitude, we're giving a Big Benny's vending machine to all active subscribers. If you've been wanting to join our subscriber program, sign up before April 17th to get this great piece of flair. There's a link in the description with more info. And uh, in addition to the Big Benny's vending machine, uh, subscribers will also receive another piece of flair next week as part of their rewards. Also, next week, we'll be announcing our revamp, the revamp to our referral program. Yep, all right, lots of stuff going on. Yeah. And tomorrow, check out Star Citizen's Happy Hour at Noon Pacific. Community manager Jared Huckabee will be interviewing members of the LA Ship Tech team on everything that goes into making spaceships for the BDSSE. And I think that's about it. So thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you around, around the verse. verse. watching so if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development please follow us on our social media channels see you soon